Let me take a moment and talk about Riverside.fm. It allows you to record studio quality audio and up to 4K video. When you need to record audio and video, Riverside.fm can do it. So if you're looking for a hero platform for all your recording needs, from podcasts to webinars to any video content, Riverside.fm. I've got a promo code for you where you'll receive a 30% discount on the first three months of your subscription. I'll give it to you twice. The promo code is ship it. All one word, ship it, and you'll pick up a 30% discount on your first three months of your subscription. Riverside.fm. Boy, do we have a great podcast for you today as we talk about some great gridiron history. On this December 12th football history headlines, we'll talk about Namus' last game in New York Green. The Browns had a quarterback who tossed five TDs in a game, and the famous rookie running back that scored six times, all coming up in just a moment. PigskinDispatch.com is a proud affiliate of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of sports yesteryear. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history on a day-to-day basis. This is your host, Darren Hayes, and we're broadcasting from the pig pen in western Pennsylvania, bringing you the memories of the gridiron, one day at a time. So, with Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff supplying us with the twos, let's go no huddle through today's football history headlines. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of pigskindispatch.com. And boy, am I excited to bring you these football history headlines for December 12th because the gridiron is filled with some great history on this day. So without further ado, let's go to December 12th, 1936. The 1937 NFL Draft had Sam Francis from the University of Nebraska going as a number one first pick by the Philadelphia Eagles. December 12, 1937, at Wrigley Field in Chicago. The National Football League Championship was played on a sloppy, muddy field surface with temperatures near kickoff near 24 degrees Fahrenheit. Quarterback Sammy Ball was quoted as saying it was the worst field conditions he had ever seen per a story on the GruelingTruth.com website. The frozen field had chards of mud sticking up across its surface with many players reported to be cut by them when they landed on the turf. The game got heated in the final stanza, though, by fine play. Trailing 21-14 in the fourth quarter, Baugh went to work. In the near-arctic conditions, Sling and Sammy Baugh hit Wayne Milner on a 78-yard bomb and completed the comeback on a 35-yard strike to Ed Justice late in the game for the go-ahead touchdown. The Washington Redskins became the champs as they beat the Chicago Bears that day 28-21. December 12, 1937, in the 1938 NFL Draft, the Cleveland Rams chose Corbett Davis from the University of Indiana as their first pick. December 12, 1950, Vic Janowitz, the fine halfback from the Ohio State Buckeyes, won the 16th Heisman Trophy. December 12, 1964, the Cleveland Browns' Frank Ryan set a franchise record of five TD passes as he went 12 of 13 for 202 yards for the Browns Nation website. Ryan even ran in another score as Cleveland upended the Giants that day, 52-20. December 12, 1965, at Wrigley Field in Chicago, Chicago Bears rookie halfback Gale Sayers ties an NFL record for the most touchdowns in a game, with a half dozen in Chicago's 61-20 victory over the San Francisco 49ers at a muddy Wrigley Field. Sayers had four rushing touchdowns on only nine carries, and he took another one across a goal line stripe via reception and added the coast-to-coast punt return for good measure. He could have probably had a seven score on the day, but coach George Hallis pulled him from the game late in the fourth quarter right before the Bears scored again. December 12, 1976, quarterback Joe Namath played his last game as a New York Jets player. As Broadway Joe played his last season in the NFL with the LA Rams. December 12, 1992, the season's Heisman Trophy Award was earned by Gino Toretta, the University of Miami quarterback. The Hurricanes went undefeated in 92, and Gino T was a big part of it. His 3,070 yards passing and 19 touchdowns helped pave the way to keep Miami team on a 29-game winning streak, with 23 of them having Toretta at the helm. The Davey O'Brien, the Johnny Unitas Golden Arm, and the Maxwell Awards were all on the Toretta medal after that season. Gino's great year helped him edge out running back Marshall Falk for the trophy. 
December 12, 2011, Robert Griffin III, the quarterback from Baylor, took home the Heisman Trophy for the 2011 season per Heisman.com. The junior signal caller was the first Baylor Bear to have the Heisman Trophy in his case. Robert's pass efficiency mark of 192.31 was the highest ever in Heisman history, and his passing of just shy of 4,000 yards with 36 TDs was nothing to sneeze at. Griffin also added nine more scores and 644 yards on the ground game. RG3 also took home the Manning Award and the O'Brien Award for his top-notch throwing that season. Now let's take a break from our football history headlines for just a moment. Focus in on that subscribe button on the Embed Player. Click it so you get all the podcasts released right to you as soon as we release them. Also, you can reach us at pigskindispatch at gmail.com. Right now, I've got a message from one of my friends at the Sports History Network. Hi, this is John Gidley. Join me each Friday for a trip into the football attic, where I'll delve into forgotten but noteworthy stories of the National Football League. You're bound to learn something new or have your memory jogged each week. That's every Friday, only on the Sports History Network and wherever podcasts are available. Now, how about we talk about some Hall of Fame birthdays for this December 12th, and we'll start off in the year 1881 in Muncie, Indiana. Zora G. Clevenger, the halfback from the University of Indiana, was born. According to the iHughHoosers.com, Z.G. Clevenger played football for the Hoosiers program from 1900 through the 1903 season, and he captained the team in that final year. After graduation, Clevenger stayed out on Indiana a few more years, coaching both the football and the basketball teams, the ones he used to star on. He left the Hoosiers for a period of time and served as a coach and athletic director at Tennessee, Kansas State, and Missouri. Zora later became the Indiana's athletic director from 1923 through 1946. Zora Clevenger joined the ranks of the College Football Hall of Fame in the year 1968. December 12, 1904, the guard of the fighting Irish of Notre Dame, John Clipper Smith, arrived into the world. Clipper was coached by Newt Rockney on the teams just after the famed Four Horsemen backfield had graduated. The National Football Foundation voted John Smith into the College Football Hall of Fame in 1975. December 12, 1914, the center from the University of California, Bob Herwig, celebrated his day of birth. FootballFoundation.org relays that North American Newspaper Alliance's board said that Herwig, an expert snapper and a first-rate tackler, he gets the edge over others of his caliber because in his 60-minute ball games, he's played from start to finish. And that sounds like a pretty solid guy in the middle to me. The NFF voters selected Bob Herwig to enter into the College Football Hall of Fame in 1964. December 12, 1930, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, the University of Kentucky's multi-position player Steve Mielinger was born. In fact, Steve was so versatile that he was aptly called Mr. Anywhere. The NFF's bio on Mielinger says that he was a two-time first-team All-American selection in 1952 and 1953, and under the Hall of Fame head coach Bear Bryant, Mielinger led Kentucky to victory in a 1952 Cotton Bowl over TCU. In 2013, the College Football Hall of Fame inducted Steve Mielinger into their fold. Steve entered into the NFL and played for the Washington Redskins after being picked by them in the 1954 NFL Draft. He also played with the Packers and the Steelers in his six-year NFL career. December 12, 1962, Brad Caleb, the quarterback from East Central University, came into this life. The National Football Foundation says that Caleb and his orange rush offense led the nation in rushing and finished among the leaders in scoring and total offense. Brad himself rushed for 1,002 yards and 14 TDs on the ground. In his senior season of 1984, he made his offense almost unstoppable as he refined his passing skills. In that campaign, Caleb used his legs for 19 touchdowns and 1,135 yards, while the aerial assault he launched garnered another 1,185 yards and 13 additional scores. The NFF found a place for the name and stats of the one Brad Caleb in their College Football Hall of Fame in the year 2003. December 12, 1967, the defensive tackle from Texas A&M Kingsville, John Randall, was delivered. John was voted as a first-team All-American player in 1988, according to the FootballFoundation.org's vial on him. John's 105 tackles and 34 career sacks helped him and his Javelina teammates to enjoy two trips into the NCAA Division II playoffs. The NFF voters selected John Randall to enter into the College Football Hall of Fame in the year 2008. Randall played for 14 years in the NFL with the Minnesota Vikings and the Seattle Seahawks.
John was named an All-Pro seven times. There were eight seasons where John recorded double-digit sacks, including when he led the NFL with a career-high 15 and a half sacks in 1997. At the time he retired, Randall's 137 and a half sacks were the top career total by a defensive tackle in NFL history. We hope you enjoyed these football history headlines, and we know you don't want to miss tomorrow's edition with the December 13th football history headlines. And to make sure you get notified of those, the second the edition of that podcast is released, please put your mouse cursor over that subscribe button and click it. You can also find the episodes of your favorite podcast provider or at pigskindispatch.com or the sportshistorynetwork.com where you'll also find many other great nostalgic sports stories and interviews and podcasts with an all-star cast of podcast hosts and guests to share some of the greatest moments in sports history. Peeking up at the clock, the time's running down. We're going to go into victory formation, take a knee, and let this baby run out. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back tomorrow for the next podcast. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. It was just another ordinary day in the offices of the Pittsburgh Guardian newspaper circa 1924. But for Marla Delft, assistant editor, everything was about to change. For she was about to discover the awesome attractiveness of Row 1 brand retro sports paraphernalia items, thanks to Orville Mulligan, sports writer. And there it is. Wow, Orville, that's really the bee's knees. Isn't it just? A poster-sized replica of the actual 1909 World Series program cover. I can see that. But where did you get it? And where'd you get it framed? I ordered it from the Row 1 website, where over 6,000 items of sports memorabilia from the 1880s to the 1990s are available for reproduction in multiple sizes and in several different materials, with over a dozen styles of frame to choose from for prints like this. Well, I'm sure Mr. Delft would love to put up more of these in the office, but I'm equally as sure they're beyond this newspaper's budget. (laughs) Not at all, my dear Marla. See for yourself. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Oh my, these are good prices. Oh, and look at this stuff. Oklahoma, Nebraska football. College basketball art. Michael Jordan items. And so it was that Marla Delft discovered the spondiferous magic of row one sports memorabilia arts and prints. You can, too, by visiting sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. That's R-O-W number one today for access to the full row one catalog of gallery prints and gifts like t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, telephone cases, coffee mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Act A for a 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at checkout. And keep your dial locked to the Sports History Network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in Orville Mulligan, sports writer. Coming soon. Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? you should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, Check out the 1963 Vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1 and save 15% off your order.